Okay, so last week we, we, we spoke, of course, about the Gaza war, and uh, we focused a lot on the question of, the, the, obviously, the extent, the damage, and the kind of carnage that, that the Israelis have been inflicting on, on Gaza. And, of course, the numbers have gone up exponentially, uh, but we focused a little bit on the way in which the war is being framed, uh, the, the level of dehumanization, especially in the West, in Europe, and especially the United States, and uh, and this is this has continued to, to to ratchet up, I think, in the U.S. and uh, in different places. And and we're just hearing now about a shooting. There's a lot of harassment going on of Arab Americans, Palestinians, Muslims in America, and we're just hearing right now that there was some shooting in Vermont. And so I was wondering, uh, Sari, if you could talk a little bit about this before we start our our main, the main part of our show today. I mean, yeah, the the. The dehumanization of Arabs in general and Palestinians in particular in the U.S. begins at the top, begins with Biden, with with his administration. And it's propagated through Congress. It's obviously propagated as well through mostly the right wing media. But to a certain extent, you know, the dehumanization of Palestinians, it's there even in mainstream, you know, sort of normal media like, you know, like The New York Times and, and, and so on. Um, and it the dehumanization doesn't necessarily mean, you know, animalization and, and so forth it doesn't mean literal demonization it, it starts with for example you know that palestinians are statistics and numbers rather than human beings with names and stories and so on if you look at for example look at the which we're going to get to later on the release of prisoners you know back and forth that the israeli ones they're always announced in the u.s media or, or the guardian with their names and their families and oh their families are waiting to see them and so on and palestinians tend to be oh yeah three you know whatever 30 more 40 more they're their numbers, and that, that is a form of dehumanization in a way. The removal of name, the removal of identity, the removal of narrative, those are all forms of dehumanization. And that's kind of characteristic across the U.S. media. But in particular, because of the way in which Biden and company are fanning the flames of this of this conflict, uh, you know, which partly involves the, dehuman, the, like the more literal dehumanization of Palestinians, that propagates, that propagates a sense of hatred Across the U.S. and it, yes, the the killings or not. I'm sorry, th- thankfully, they're not killings. The shootings of these three students in Vermont today, all of them college students at, at different places in the northeast of the U.S. I think one is at Brown, one is at other places. Uh, you know, they're they're not the first time we see violence against Palestinians in the U.S. At the very beginning of this conflict, there was that six year old boy in suburban Chicago, Wadir, uh, who was shot and killed by by his own la- or attacked, but I guess that was attacked with a knife by his own land. So this sense of the dehumanization and violence against Palestinians, it's endorsed at the top, it runs throughout American culture, uh, you know, more or less, more subtle, less subtle, more violent, less violent. It's all, it's kind of, it's pretty consistent with what we're seeing. And then just to wrap up on this point, when we see our university, you know, upper leaderships, like I'll speak from my university anyway, when they, when they issue statements saying, you know, we mourn the loss of Israeli life. And then, oh yeah, by the way, as a footnote, some Palestinians were also killed, which is how they essentially what the statements they've been making about Gaza. It's like, well, that's also de- that's another form of dehumanization that one kind of life is to be valued, one kind of person, one kind of human being is to be valued.
this uh, access to humanitarians, and at the same time calls for immediate and unconditional release of all hostages held by Hamas. So, so they, they kind of name Hamas and other groups, but they don't mention the prisoners uh, that are being held in, in Israeli jails. That comes later, but the UN itself does not call for it in this resolution, of course. And, and I, I just found this interesting because the whole debate around this, it's not just language, I think it's not just discourse, I think it's, it has a very real impact, which is the question of uh, this dirty word, especially in the US, which is ceasefire. And uh, they, they kind of downgraded it at various levels, not even cessation of hostility, not even humanitarian pause, but they added, and the Europeans did the same thing a, a couple of weeks ago, and they, they added the S, the so humanitarian pause is, and that was specifically to allow the Israelis to kind of continue. I mean, that is to say, the worry was, well, if you say humanitarian pause, then it might be, well, you're pausing it, then it's very difficult to restart it somehow. It's, it's you know, doesn't, it, it doesn't really work very well. Whereas if you add the S, the implication is clear that you pause it and then you can restart and then you can pause again and you can restart. And it's really in the Israeli hands rather than sort of having the pressure to stop and not restart. So I think that's actually quite dangerous, the way in which uh, this was this was negotiated. I, I, I personally was quite critical of this kind of language. I, I realized, of course, that that's the only language that the U.S., which is, uh, you know, which is which is protecting the Israelis. But I find it almost more dangerous than if no resolution was passed at all, because uh, in reality, it's it seems to have legitimized this American Israeli word of pauses rather than ceasefire, where the pressure for ceasefire is continuing you know, because of all the carnage that's being, you know, increasingly clear on the ground, uh, on, on televisions everywhere, and the shift, the very, very palpable shift that, that I see in global public opinion. So I think it's quite dangerous because it's also detached entirely from the actual mediation process that was taking place anyway on the ground uh, in which the, 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 you know, the hostage kind of prisoner exchange was taking place. So I don't know if you guys had, had you know, w- want to talk about that, uh, uh, what's, you know, this discussions at the level of uh, of the United States, the Biden administration at the UN, if there's anything you know, interesting that you found as well. Well, I mean, the, the, the question, of course, I mean, just to go back to the question of the Palestinians, you mentioned at the beginning, the three students who were shot um, in Vermont. I mean, we don't, we still don't know, of course, what the motives were, right? I mean, that they're still, to be, to be fair, we don't know yet what, what the story is. Well, they were but, in cafes, apparently. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, in fact, they were uh, shot because they're Palestinian. Uh, and, of course, there was last week the whole case in New York City of that guy, the Obama, former Obama official who was, do you remember that guy? The guy was videotaped sort of, or, or filmed, yeah. basically harassing and, and on a, in a racist tirade. So I'm not surprised at all at anything that's been said. But, Karim, in terms of the point that you're making about the UN, the question about... The first question is, why is there a humanitarian, a so-called humanitarian pause? I mean, this kind of horrible language uh, uh, pauses as opposed, well, no, it's the first of, it's a, it is a humanitarian pause, and it may be the first of several humanitarian pauses, as you're putting it. But the fact of the matter is, and the question that I keep struggling with is, is this a reflection of UN diplomacy, or is it a fact that on the ground, the Israelis were not able, other than the mass devastation and the killing of thousands of children, and tens of thousands of, of uh, civilians, and the, the wounding of tens of thousands of civilians, and the utter sort of annihilation of, of Gaza, is that the reason, their inability to actually accomplish anything against Hamas as such? Is that the reason why there's a ceasefire in effect? And we call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter what we call it, is it one question? Does, it doesn't matter whether we call it, because in the end, it's, it's a reflection of what's going on on the ground, as opposed to the kind of duplicity and the hypocrisy and the double standard of Western diplomats. Well, I, I think, you know, I think we, we've seen this in previous battles and wars. So we saw this in the 2006 war that the Israelis launched in Lebanon and they ended up after 33 days, uh, UN resolution 1701, which created actually still, uh, there's a cessation of hostilities. Well, not any longer, but there was a cessation of hostilities. And of course, these things take place at both levels, at the level of the UN, at this kind of international diplomacy, what happens is effectively the United States protects the Israelis as much as possible. Uh, all the other actors try to try to kind of you know slowly, shyly try to push for a certain language. Uh, the U.S. says no, 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 and then eventually, and this is where the connection with what's going on on the ground becomes very, very important. Whether it was with Hezbollah in 2006 in Lebanon, and now in Hamas, it's very, very clear. The fact that militarily on the ground Hamas was not defeated. Uh, at that level, and Hezbollah certainly was not defeated in 2006, means that the kind of public pressure, because of the the, the onslaught, because of the absolute humanitarian damage, and, and that that becomes apparent, 
And because of that's going on at the same time, the, the pressure builds up that forces the Security Council to, to come up with something. So the U.S. kind of relents uh, to, to, to kind of allow something to happen, but pushes back on any kind of language that makes it kind of commit to something beyond the most minimal. And this, so this is what's happened here. They tried this in 2006, before the Resolution 1701. There was a couple of drafts that were being pushed that were very, very strong kind of pro-Israeli, very kind of Chapter 7, muscular kind of Security Council resolutions. Uh, that didn't get very far because Hezbollah was not losing militarily. In fact, they were gaining more and more on the ground. And the Israelis were inflicting more and more damage and carnage on the ground, including the kind of Kana massacre that happened in, in one of the villages in southern Lebanon. Uh, so eventually, when it became clear that the Israelis could not could not defeat Hezbollah on the ground, eventually the Americans and the French in that case relented, and they ended up negotiating a resolution, the 1701, which ended up sort of a bit of everything. But it did at least kind of come to the cessation of hostilities with a clear understanding that Hezbollah uh, had won politically, symbolically, and psychologically and kind of prepared the stage for the, for the next stage in which Hezbollah simply grew and became a regional actor. I think this is part of what they are driving the Americans and Israelis now, that they do not want uh, the same thing to happen to Hamas, where if Hamas kind of comes out, and despite the unbelievable destruction, the humanitarian destruction, civilians, all the, this, this focus on killing children that they are absolutely you know, working on, if Hamas emerges not defeated, let alone proclaiming victory of some kind, then they might come out very much empowered, much stronger. And then, you know, that would then force a kind of UN resolution that would lead to a cessation of hostilities or something like that, a bit stronger, um, and, and would leave Hamas kind of in a stronger position militarily. I think they're trying to push this as much as possible, to avoid this as much as possible, but I think this is a matter of days. I don't believe when the Israelis say this is going to go on for months and it's going to go on into 2024, I don't believe this at all. I don't think... Public opinion will allow this. I don't think even the Europeans, it's interesting, the Europeans are switching. Leave the Germans aside because they've gone a bit crazy, as, as far as I can tell. But the, the UK even has, uh, Cameron now, the foreign minister, has come in um, and said, you know, they're, they're speaking relative to what they were two, three weeks ago. They're saying it needs to end. They're not using ceasefire, but they're using kind of language that's pushing. Uh, and it's interesting that even Joe Biden, even Joe Biden and his administration are now saying, okay, okay, you know, we need to look, we need also to look at the West Bank. We need to look at the killings that are taking place there. They're, for the first time, as, as far as I can tell, they're using language against being very clear about the settlers in the West Bank and trying to roll that back. And even saying we need to punish the extremist settlers in the West Bank for what they're doing there. That seems to be now the concession. We allow Gaza to go on, but we'll focus on the West Bank as something where we we will we won't allow the settlers to kind of go on a rampage. I think this is this is this is what seems to be the deal, and I think it's going to be pushed more and more. So my question to Sadi is 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 isn't it and Karim as well? Isn't it also uh, or the reality is that these humani- the so-called humanitarian pause. I mean, the language is so obscene in a, in a sense because it's not about ceasefire and it's not about justice and it's not about anything like that. It's just about pausing the Israeli sort of killing machine in Gaza. And the question is, isn't that really basically part and parcel of the Israeli? I mean, this sort of contradicts what I was saying earlier, maybe, but doesn't it doesn't it sort of feed into or play into the Israeli strategy, which is to depopulate Gaza, especially the northern part of Gaza, to, to, to expel the population, to create a humanitarian pause, to allow people to flee south, to put more pressure on Egypt, to put more pressure, of course, on the Palestinians, first and foremost, and and then to, to, to then go back to killing as soon as this as soon as they've accomplished some of their sort of goals. I mean, how do you, how do you read it? I mean, that's part of it. And, and the, the, the attention that Karim was drawing earlier to the, to the, lang- to the, the language of humanitarian wow. pauses, plural, which obviously implies that there will be, if there are more pauses to come, that means that there's more violence in between sure. the pauses. I mean, yeah. That's like baked into the term, so, which, is, you know, which, is, which is telling. And, and yes, it's sort of like there was an earlier stage where they said, okay, we're going to stop bombing four hours a day to let people flee. So it was like this alternation of, four hours of ethnic cleansing with 20 hours of genocide. And that, that's basically kind of, the, you know, that's kind of where things were. But I still think, I still think it's worth backing up a little bit and thinking a little bit more about, about this because it's, it seems to me, there's several different things here. Seems, one thing that seems pretty clear is that the Israelis went into this without, I don't think that they had a very clear or rational plan as to what they were going to do other than, 
other than just sort of bombing the hell out of anything that moved and everything that didn't move as well, which is kind of classic Israeli sort of like shoot first and ask questions afterwards. It's kind of that's their modus operandi. It has that's, that's nothing nothing new or original about it in that sense. But the other thing is that it seems to me the U.S. has no clue what's going. Which again is not not particularly surprising or, or unusual. It's not the first time the U.S. seems to have. It seems like both the Americans and the Israelis are talking as though, for example, they're talking as though Hamas will be defeated. I mean, even even in the stuff about ceasefires and all the stuff going on you know, in the background here in the U.S. at the level of the administration, it's all about well, afterwards we're going to have this will happen or that will happen. But the assumption is that the Israelis will defeat Hamas. And it seems, I mean, you know, I, who knows what's going to happen in the next few weeks. It seems to me, based on what's happened the previous five weeks, as Karim was saying earlier, that, you know, the Israelis are very good at killing huge numbers of people, children, you know, people, civilians, blowing up houses and demolishing, and do, doing what they do, what they've been doing for 75 years. It's not, that's in and of itself, it's not new. The scale is appalling. And the scale of violence, which we should pause and talk about at some point, is... Like this, this, what's happening now is not like 2006. It's like 2006 on steroids or 1982 on steroids. Like we've never seen a scale of damage and violence like what they're doing right now. To so talk about 8,000 children killed. I mean, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's extraordinary just in terms of the scale. But in terms of, this goes back to something I've said before, many of us have said before, the sheer capacity to inflict harm does not translate into the attainment of political objectives, which is what war is supposed to be about. That they seem not to have read Clausewitz or whoever it was who said that. This is about, at the end of the day, it's about attaining political objectives. So I think the 2006 war is, is instructive in that case too, because they seem to have gone into it saying, we are going to, we are going to smash and we will do this and we will do this and we will do this. And the Americans are like, yeah, 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 are these guys, are they going to do this and they're going to do this? But they're not doing, other than killing and blowing houses up, they are not attaining anything in, in, in military, I mean, in, in properly speaking military terms, which is to say they're not defeating Hamas militarily. They have not rescued one single uh, prisoner held, held by Hamas in this entire five weeks of, of bombing and so on. They're not, it's clear, and they're also, what's also clear is that they are taking pretty considerable military casualties of their own in, in numbers that seem to be very, very unclear. There's all kinds of reports from inside Israel as to the level of combatant casualties that they are suffering, and who knows what's actually happening. But clearly, Everybody's seen those videos of the tanks being destroyed and the armored personnel carriers being being wiped out, and and you know the, the level the, they are clearly unable to translate their their theoretical will on the battlefield, meaning fighting a determined resistance, as opposed to shooting children and blowing up apartment buildings, which they're very good at. So I don't know where that's going to leave us. So I think I think neither the Americans nor the Israelis, in terms of the governments, have a very clear plan as to or if they have a plan. It's like a plan that's sort of like, you know, something in Jonathan Swift, like it exists in a kind of, you know, cloud nine level, but not, it doesn't connect to the actual reality on the ground, which is why I think we need to look, as Karim was saying earlier, I mean, Karim would be, it would actually be worth recapping what was that history of 2006 about, because you've written a lot about this, like the, the original resolutions, you you said it in passing now, but maybe spend another couple of minutes reminding our listeners about this, like the, the, the what the, what the Israelis originally wanted in terms of a resolution of the UN and what they ended up getting, which was, which was nowhere near what they, what they wanted, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there, there's a bunch of things that I wanted to say, but I mean, just for this, uh, yes, I mean, when, when the Israelis went in, of course, and there was a similar thing when Hezbollah uh, captured these, these soldiers, they went just past the, the so-called blue line uh, in, in, on the, on the, you know, between between the Israeli side and the, and the Lebanese side, and they captured the soldiers with the express idea of exchanging prisoners. So they took them on the basis that, of course, Israelis had all these Lebanese prisoners that, for many, many, many years, they refused to negotiate, they refused to release. They, you know, they, you know, this this is the usual thing. It's quite similar to what happened uh, in this, in this, uh, in, you know, in, in Gaza now at the beginning of it. It was an explicit idea, and we're seeing it today to try to exchange to get prisoners out of the Israeli jails. So. It, they 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 started the attack, and once they started the attack, uh, they were able. You know, of course, Hezbollah was was uh, was able to absorb these kinds of attacks. So so the Israelis went the second step and the third step. They started to destroy all the villages on the near the border, and then they started to expand outwards. And then they hit all the so-called Shia areas. Uh, they they call them Shia areas in in Beirut. Absolute destruction of all the areas that could be considered Shia areas. 
uh, and raids in all these areas, um, and uh, all the time killing more people, massive humanitarian, uh, uh, you know, internally displaced humanitarian disaster, killings, uh, destruction of infrastructure, water infrastructure, elect electricity, all these kinds of things, fuel depots, um, you know, this, this, this sort of thing, but at the same time, unable, totally unable to degrade Hezbollah military, who actually grew uh, with each passing day. Uh, and so they got more and more frustrated. And once they had reached the end of all of their targets, they, the Americans, in fact, on their behalf, went and tried to negotiate some kind of UN, UN resolution uh, and tried to kind of put forth a resolution. And they did put forth a, a, a draft resolution, which, if you strip it down, basically calls for NATO. It called for some kind of NATO force under Chapter 7, which is the peace enforcement part of the UN Charter. So it did not require the consent of the host state, meaning Lebanon. So they wanted a, you know, that kind of very muscular force to come in and basically mop up, clean up, get rid of whatever remnants, supposedly whatever remnants of Hezbollah existed, and create a kind of a Lebanese government and restore, as they would see it, the kind of Lebanese government authority throughout all of Lebanon, and really politically in a way that would be very, uh, and demilitarize all of South Lebanon in a way that would be that would suit Israeli interests uh, that have been long standing for for many many decades all of that of course uh, they that so that draft resolution was very interesting because it showed what it is, is that the americans and israelis wanted in an ideal condition what's interesting of course is that because hezbollah was not defeated militarily on the ground and in fact they grew and they came out much much stronger by the end of these 33 days uh, they were they were unable to impose such a resolution so the ultimate resolution that came was something, as I said, that was kind of quite mixed. There was a lot of, they, they kept some of this kind of chapter seven language, you know, that's that it's sort of muscular language. But in fact, uh, it, 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 there was no enforcement mechanism. So it effectively allowed for the existing peacekeepers, the UNIFIL who had been there since the Israeli invasion in 1978, uh, supposedly on an interim basis, they, it, it made them more robust. So it increased the numbers of, of, the, of the UNIFIL soldiers that were there uh, to up to 15,000. It increased their mandate. It made them more, uh, it, it kind of told them they have to do more patrolling in search for, supposedly in search of Hezbollah weapons and you know, try to disarm anybody that was not the Lebanese army or UNIFIL that was operating in southern Lebanon. So all of this kind of, it, it was almost like a cat and mouse game in order to create a cessation of hostilities. And of course, Hezbollah, as we, as, as, as we all know, of course, continued to arm, continued to get much, much stronger. And as I said, they became a regional actor uh, in, in, the, in the years after that. Uh, so Hezbollah now is this incredibly strong military force that has not, that's, that is fighting, actually. There is a, an active war that is going on on, between, on the border, but in the Israeli side for the first time. There's the, it's, it's in South Lebanon, but it's also in, in the northern Israeli lands over there. So there is this kind of war that is ongoing it's not on a hugely dramatic scale but it could escalate if something you know something happens it could escalate but there is this war that's going on and sort of my overall point here is precisely that these un resolutions that we're talking about will will you know the americans that protect israelis of course can fantasize all they want about a very tough resolution but ultimately it always gets settled on the military balance on the ground and insofar as as it appears, and who knows, you know, but as it appears, Hamas does not seem to be destroyed by, by any means on the ground, despite the carnage. Uh, and in fact, we, they seem to be inflicting, you know, fairly heavy, at least relatively heavy losses on, on the Israelis that are entering, going in the ground forces. Uh, it, you, you're not going to come up with a, with a resolution that's going to be any effective on that political balance. What's important for the UN resolution, as far as for, for people like us, is the idea of creating a ceasefire, not for the political purposes, but for the humanitarian, to stop the carnage, to make sure that people, yes, children, women, but you know, men, everybody uh, in, in Gaza, just don't have to go through this uh, unprecedented uh, attack and carnage that is taking place in Gaza, and so that they can begin to think about returning to their lands and begin to think about the reconstruction uh, to, to get their lives together, to, to, to kind of to, to send the UN people and all the human rights people and all the, the, the doctors and the health people to come in, kind of create temporary hospitals, schools, all, all the kind of thing that humanitarians are so good at doing. And, and all of this is prepared and ready to go at, at, the, at the Egyptian border with Gaza. And so this is, this is hugely important for the UN, the Security Council, to focus on that 
The issue is the Israelis and uh, President Biden himself, who seems personally committed to support the Israelis. I mean, personally, it's very strange. Maybe you guys can, can talk about that, but personally seems to be committed to protect the Israelis at all costs. They don't want any resolution that would help, that would protect over the short, you know, medium to longer term, the civilians in Gaza, if it meant that Hamas could emerge politically stronger. So how do we stop? And so there is this balance, and this is the fight that's taking place. So Karim, how do we, or Zadi, how do we, how do we stop that? I mean, how, not we, but how do you, I mean, in other words, if, if there's, if the will is, you're saying the will is there to just so-called, quote unquote, destroy Hamas, this was the stated this was a stated sort of goal from the first minute right uh, after october 7th to destroy hamas which is the same language they used in 2006 vis-a-vis hezbollah destroy hezbollah right the difference is that here it, we're, we're talking about the scale and you both both of you guys said that the israelis have not been able to accomplish they don't have a strategy but it seems that there is a strategy the strategy is to depopulate Gaza, is to push the uh, which they've already done uh, over a million and a half people from the north to the south to destroy the entire infrastructure, to destroy the basis of life, to destroy hospitals. I mean, nobody that I can remember in all in my decades of, of teaching, I can't remember any force that's gone around destroying hospital after hospital after hospital in such an extraordinarily vicious and, and horrific way and, and overt way. They don't even pretend anymore that they're not targeting hospitals because that's what they're doing. And with U.S. support, so why do you guys assume that they're not accomplishing that there isn't a, a goal, which is to depopulate North Gaza, irrespective of what Hamas does or doesn't do. And B, why are you assuming that that uh, they're not actually, um, that they're going to stop anytime soon? I mean, what pressures? They, they seem to be completely um, opposed to or sort of insensitive to pressure, outside pressure. Because inside, the question is, inside Israel, there seems to be overwhelming support for destroying for for the the mass devastation of Gaza and of course there's extraordinary racism against the Palestinians of Gaza and there is a commitment to destroy them so how do you guys read this vis-a-vis what Kenny was saying earlier about the UN because I see I understand everything Kenny is saying about the UN resolution I just don't see and and the the, the diplomacy but I just I, I it seems to me that they are accomplishing something as horrific as it is on the ground and how does that figure into your analysis? I mean, there's what the it goes back to what we were saying before. They're they're accomplishing the devastation of Gaza or, and and right? ethnic cleansing no, and and ethnic at least at least temporary ethnic cleansing. Now, how long how long that will remain? In I mean, for example, during the Nakba of 1948, they didn't just terrify people away. They also held the ground. I mean, part if you're going to ethnically cleanse, you also you need to hang on to the territory yourself. Oh yeah, which means having an army sitting there. And if you have an army sitting there, it means an army under attack. So they. So they're back to occupying Gaza again. Some of them say, like the more the more you know, let's say excitable among them, Smotrich and those guys talk about not just reoccupying Gaza but resettling Gaza too with 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 Jewish settlers. This is this goes back to what I mean. In a way, I, they're operating at three or four different levels simultaneously, not and not necessarily in a coordinated way. Yeah. So yes, they're undoubtedly inflicting damage. They're un- undoubtedly killing huge numbers of people. They're inflicting incredible harm. And just, you know, this obsession that they have with hospitals, I think it is, as far as I know, it's I mean, even even in World War II, because they keep saying, oh, well, yeah, but, like, you know, the British and Americans bombed Dresden in 1945. It's like, yes, but that but the Geneva Conventions came after the bombing of Dresden, and presumably partly in response to the bombing of Dresden and Tokyo and Hiroshima and all the rest of it. But it's not just that. They're, just, they're talking in this way, I and mean, they're doing these kinds of things, this obsession with destroying hospitals. And but on the other hand, to 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 translate into reoccupying Gaza, eliminating Hamas, maintaining their authority, their control, their power in Gaza, imposing their will on Gaza, politically, not just in terms of killing people, that doesn't there, that there seemed I, again who knows, but it, as far as I could tell, at least from what where we are so far, which is longer, is it now twice the length of the war in two thousand six? I don't know if it's. It's getting towards it's getting, twice. It's getting, it won't yeah. be much longer. We'll be twice as long. And there, as I said, the resistance, you know, to, uh, to their presence on the ground is completely unwavering. They're still fighting their attacks on their occupying soldiers that take place in Beit Hanun, which is, which is like you know, a hundred meters from the from the fence. It's like it's it's like it's kind of like Maruna Ras in two thousand and six, a village on the border with with 
with the, with the Galilee, basically, and yet, yet fighting the first day, fighting all through the war, fighting on the last day of the war in two thousand six in Marwanda. It seems like it seems like the closest comparison I could think of, other than the sheer scale of violence being inflicted, is two thousand six. And I, I'm not a prophet, and I can't predict, but it seems like that's kind of where we're going. If I were, if you know, just if I were to bet, or if I were to predict, I would say this is going to end. I would assume something like the way 2006 ended. They're going to have to, they're not going to have their way. They're not going to be able to assert their will, neither the Israelis nor the Americans. They're going to have to eat some kind of pie in the end. They're, they're not going to get what they want in the UN. The difference is they'll have killed, instead of killing 1,100 people as they did in Lebanon in 2006, they're going to have killed 15, 20, uh, who no, knows? A lot more than that. When, what, when their bloodlust will be satiated, I don't know. But they, they, I know that they can't go on doing this open-ended. They can't kill 2 million people. They can't go on doing this open-endedly. And so at some point, they're going to have to stop. Whether they want to or not, they're going to have to stop, it seems to me. But Kareem, can you, can you just jump on this point? Kareem, can you jump in on this point about what Sadi is saying about that they, are, they, they can't do this? But in 2006, since we keep making, and you started with this comparison of 2006, there wasn't this Western sort of liberal hysteria and sort of support for Israel in the way that you've seen since October 7th. Honestly, I, I can't. I mean, there, there, there's always been, there's always been, there's always been Western government support for Israel. There's always been Western institutional support for Israel, but not this kind of, this kind of manic, sort of racist, uh, overt, ghoulish sort of support for the destruction that that we've seen. And and so, how do how do you how do you see the difference? Wait, wait, one sec, one sec, Kareem. But just just to introduce, because uh, Kareem made this point in passing, I yeah. didn't come back, Kareem, but. Yes, there has been so far maniacal Western support, especially yeah. the British, because because we know who they are and their history and all the rest of it. Yeah. And obviously the Germans, Kareem said, who are on a different dimension altogether when it comes to this stuff, because they're trying, as has been long remarked, they're trying to, to expatiate their own guilt from their own, what they did in the Holocaust and their history of and legacy of anti-Semitism and make other people pay the price for their own criminality. But other than them, there are now cracks, like Belgium, Belgium, the Belgians are saying things, the Spanish, is, the Spanish Prime Minister. From, from the start, to, to be fair, the Belgians and the Spanish were good from the beginning, yeah. Right, so Karim, yeah. Go ahead, tell us this difference. No, no, I, I think just based on what you guys are saying, I think two, two important, two caveats, two things I think important to, to say. The first is that Lebanon, unlike Gaza, obviously, even geographically, when the when the Israelis and so a thousand two hundred thousand three hundred people were civilians were killed there, and which at the time was huge, and the extent of destruction was 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 unprecedented in in in, in all those kinds of wars. But what Lebanon had, what what the southern Lebanese had, was that they could, as internally displaced, they could go into other parts of Lebanon that were not going to be attacked, that were supported in a sense. The Americans, the Europeans, would never allow Beirut and the non-Shia part of Beirut, as they say. Uh, to be hit, uh, the, the mountains, the, the northern parts, you know, where internal displaced could go, and refugees could, could go and displaced could go to Syria. The border of Syria was open, and that was extremely important uh, as a way to, in a sense, limit, let, let's put it this way, to kind of limit the extent of death, actual death, as opposed to infrastructure uh, destruction, which the Israelis did hugely. So that was very important. That's why the, the minute, and I mean the minute, the Israeli, this, the, the resolution 17-1 came into effect in 2006, in August of 2006. Uh, it, the, the, if you remember the pictures, people just got up, hundreds of thousands of people just displaced, got up and went straight back to their villages. And it was very important for people and for Hezbollah generally, but also just for people to show, to make a point that this is our land, we're going right back, we're not going to be in tents sitting outside, we're not going to be displaced and refugees and stuff like that. So they went straight back. And in return, there was a lot of reconstruction money that came in very quickly, led by the Qataris and, and other Gulf and, and other kinds of donors that came in, as well as you know the, 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 the usual kind of humanitarian people in the UN and all these people that were working well on the ground, UNICEF and OCHA and all these. But the Qataris put in quite a bit of money uh, to help reconstruct their through existing, uh, infra through existing political and, and governmental institutions that were still working on the ground. So that's very, very important. That obviously, Gaza, they don't have that. They're totally besieged. They've been besieged for, what is it, you know, almost two decades now. Uh, they cut off the Egyptians from one side, the Israelis on the, all the other sides. And so impossible. So when they're going, we're talking about moving from northern part to southern part. You, you know, there's nowhere that's actually safe. Maybe relatively safer, but nowhere is safe. And the Israelis keep pushing and then bombing and saying, okay, push and then bomb and push and bomb. That's their tactic. 
So that's that's uh, I think it's very important to, to kind of to to put that in. The second thing is that you know I think the, the the second point that I wanted to make is that the Israelis in 2006 said our objective was to destroy Hezbollah, dismantle them, or weaken them to the point where they were no longer effective. And then that's why they wanted that draft resolution. The Americans were trying to produce a draft resolution that would send in a NATO type force to kind of clean up and and disarm you know whatever remnants there were and and you know kind of create a, an atmosphere that was suitable for the Israelis there. Same thing here. The Israelis declared that they wanted to destroy Hamas. That's not going to happen. In other words, the removal of the the utter destruction of the northern part of, of Gaza of Hazi was not something that they had declared originally. That's that is happening because that's what they can do from afar, from that's the military might that they have. And that's the protection they're getting from, especially the U.S. and some European countries, but the U.S. in particular, that is allowing them to do this and negotiating this kind of U.N. resolution. Well, first of all, postponing uh, 30, 40 days before we got to a U.N. resolution. The Americans had vetoed previous resolution uh, uh, and, and you know, behind the scenes, they stopped all the, the global South countries that you know, kept trying to put various drafts. The Americans ensured that that would not work. Uh, eventually, this kind of weak resolution was passed. But it's showing a trend where the Americans are the, uh, the Americans and the Israelis are kind of making it up as they go along. And so when you see this this kind of pushing of people towards the southern part of Hazi, this is almost uh, something that they want to do in order that knowing that they cannot destroy Hamas, that I think that objective they understand is not going to happen because they don't have a year and two and three to do this. They know that window of utter destruction that they're doing now, that window is rapidly, rapidly closing, I think. And I don't think we'll be more than another week or two you know, in, in the direction it's moving. But what they want to do is they want to be able to give the Israelis something so that they can emerge and say, well, we, we, we have, you know, we got something out of this. And that's the removal of what they're going to say. We moved all of Hamas and all the Hamas terrorists and all the hospitals that housed Hamas terrorists and, you know, that, all this kind of stuff. Move them, create a humanitarian zone in the south or some parts in the south. The American diplomacy to get Egypt to open up and absorb all these Palestinians, that failed. I think Anthony Blinken is going to go down as one of the worst U.S. diplomats that there has been. He has, he has failed at every single corner of what they've been trying to do. And uh, even trying to get the Egyptians to open up, they're a very close ally, uh, trying to bribe them, trying to give them money, trying to, trying to uh, you know, re uh, remove all the debts that they have. There's a lot of economic and financial problems in Egypt. Even that... They're unable, they were unable to do. What I think is going to happen, you know, if we're looking a bit forward, is that they're going to try eventually when there is a ceasefire, they're going to just try to do de facto, well, we need to open up some humanitarian corridors into Gaza. I'm hearing discussions of humanitarian, uh, uh, overseas humanitarian corridor to Cyprus. I mean, you're hearing now different things. And my worry is, and people like Hassan Abu Sitta has been talking about this, this idea of trying that they're going to try to accomplish a kind of ethnic cleansing under humanitarian guys post ceasefire that they were unable to really do in the middle of this war. And I think this is really important to point out. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Kareem. But I think that, that we have to also remember that, that in history in 1948 and after 1948 and the Nakba of 48, that's exactly what they tried as well. I mean, the whole discourse of moving Palestinian refugees and moving them out and resettling them around the Arab world has been a plan you know, or has been a thought and has been a discourse and a plan and sort of proposals that have been floated for decades and haven't succeeded as such. And so it's not clear that this is going to succeed either. Um, but what you're saying, so what you're both saying essentially is that like the parallels with the Nakba and the second Nakba and all this that we've heard over at Seti's point is that, that, well, that presupposes that the Israelis are actually controlling on the ground and not allowing people to go back. But the, do they need to be on the ground to control people? Because they can keep they can keep firing their drones, and they keep. I mean, maybe you're right. That's a good point, and it's it's worth bearing in mind that this idea that that in the end they don't have the same kind of overwhelming power, you know, on the ground, the way they had in '48 after they had destroyed all of the Arab society, all of Palestinian society, and people were in complete disarray, and had no really had no experience and no 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 understanding in a sense, because they were, the Palestinians I'm talking about, they were totally victimized. They had, they had no comprehension of what, in fact, was in store for them, whereas now people do have a sense, have a very powerful sense after decades and decades yeah. of knowing about this and knowing this history inside out. And, um, and so there's that situation.
yeah, there's a shift. But the question about Hamas, what you're saying, Karim and Sadi, what you're both saying is that if the Israelis are not, and the Americans are not able to accomplish their primary objective goal, which was to, quote, unquote, destroy Hamas, that's what the, the rhetoric they used in the beginning, and, and, and the sort of their, their sort of strident discourse about that. If they don't accomplish that, then what you're saying, in effect, is that Hamas is going to emerge stronger from this, the way Hezbollah emerged stronger in 2006. In fact, Hamas is going to become, without any doubt, the most powerful Palestinian national organization as a result of this war and as a result of the fact that they were putting their money where their mouth is, in a sense, as opposed to uh, Abu Mazen and, and the utterly corrupt PA, um, Palestinian Authority, which the Americans and the Europeans keep trying to sort of resuscitate. And in fact, they, there were these ideas weren't about floating or taking them to, to take over Gaza after after this war, which seems absurd, honestly, on the face of it. So is that what you're saying? You're saying that Hamas, you think Hamas is going to emerge stronger from this despite the carnage? It, it, who, who knows? But it, it looks like if the Israelis said, we're going to destroy Hamas or dismantle it, if they don't do that, which is not looking likely that, that, that they're going to do this, they're going to emerge politically and psychologically on top. That's how I see it. I mean, who knows? It, it's, it's not clear how things are going to go. So as long as militarily they're able to, to resist, then I think that's the inevitable outcome. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because you talk about the Nakba. I just want to make this point about the Nakba, Salma, because you, you talked about the Nakba, the original Nakba. And, that's his, and you know, people talking about the, the, this is like Nakba continuation. That was what they wanted. And they wanted to destroy Hamas and push everybody and kind of do this, you know, push this kind of ethnic cleansing. They've been unable to destroy Hamas so far in any case. And I think they have lost, I think there was an inflection point maybe a week or two ago because of the carnage, because of this fanatical destruction of, of, of the infrastructure, buildings, of especially hospitals. There's this whole dramatic things about the Shifa Hospital and, and, and these different hospitals. I think that really broke even within this kind of hardcore Western governmental officials, have, they, even they've been visibly broken on this and unable anymore to defend. And, and what I'm saying is I think there's an interesting shift. Even Anthony Blinken, the, the, this, this unbelievable failed diplomat, who's going, who, you know, one day hopefully will be held to account, at least in, in history textbooks, uh, even he's been saying that uh, it's as part of, it, he put a red line when he was in, in, you know, going around the Arab countries. And he said, being pushed back even by the Saudis, by the Qataris, and by the Egyptians, he made a point saying we will not allow Palestinians to be to to be effectively to be cleansed from the area. They will be allowed to return to their lands. So these the, the Americans have declared this now because the the Americans yeah. keep saying the Americans keep saying that they they don't they don't accept coerced population removal. But so in other words, what they're saying is, but if population wants to leave. They're free. No, no, they have, they have, they have said that. But the thing is, so I mean, they have said that the language has, has changed. But they're basically the idea is they have had to in their concessions with with their negotiations uh, behind the scenes with the Arab governments, including the Saudis. This was a precondition. They had to come out and declare this because ultimately, when there's a reconstruction, who do you think is going to foot the bill? So the Egyptians don't want it. The Saudis certainly don't want it. There's not a single Arab country, even the so-called friendly countries to the Israelis. Nobody wants this. It plays, it's something the, the, across the Arab world and the Muslim world, there's opposition to this. So the Americans, Blinken had to come out and say, okay, we want that people will be able, effectively people will be able to go back. So they've given up at, at the surface. Now, who knows what happens on the ground again? I mean, these things change. But they, the idea that they actually had to say it was directly because militarily the Israelis, as they did in 2006, overshot, overreached, talked about objectives that they cannot reach, possibly, and all the discussion of a post-Hamas government. Now, we don't hear this quite as much, post-Hamas this and post-Hamas that. It's clear you're not going to have a post-Hamas government. And, and, and I think maybe it's, we should shift to this other point, which is, and this is a kind of, I think, a good segue, which is when I talk about post-Hamas, but at the same time, we have the, the prisoner exchange that, that I'd like you guys to talk about more. In this prisoner exchange, de facto, through the Qatari mediation, it played the most important role. But effectively, it's negotiating with Hamas. So there's a recognition of Hamas, the way in which there was a recognition of Hezbollah diplomatically. And this is, this is a huge political victory, in a sense, for Hamas, because no one else, it was the Qataris are, you know, are 
have played a very important mediating role for, for many, many years. They're the ones who've been sending money to Gaza by the millions and millions. They were the main backers and the main funders of, of you know, infrastructure projects inside, inside Gaza. So uh, the fact that Hamas is doing this, and when you look at the pictures, you see how well organized they are in picking up the prisoners and handing them to the Red Cross. And, you know, it's, it's very, very well choreographed. And there's clearly a recognition that they had to negotiate directly, both through, through the Qataris, but also directly, in a sense, with Hamas. So it, I, I'd like you guys to talk about these images that we're seeing in the exchanges. On the one hand, this incredible, uh, this, this, this unbelievable level of, of joy that are coming in when the Palestinian prisoners are being released um, from prisons that, are, that they've been held in for, for you know, some cases for many, many years, and of course, without charges for the most part and women and children and minors, etc. And on the other hand, this, this kind of, this other very differently portrayed way in which Hamas is very professionally releasing uh, the, these, 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 the Israeli prisoners, uh, you know, kids and, and, and old women, etc. And they're going back to, to there in, a, in much less fanfare, very controlled and very sedate. So maybe, Sarah, you want to talk about this and how it ties in? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the prisoners, and I'll get to that in a second. But I also want to just remark, on, we were talking before about the possibility if the Israelis are unable to defeat Hamas militarily, no matter for, no matter what destruction they do, if they're unable to defeat Hamas on the battlefield, which, seem, which they seem unable to do, again, who knows what will happen. But so far, that seems that that's where, where we are. That's going to, that will augment Hamas's, uh, you know, position, political position, more generally, but with the, now with the with the accomplishment of the prisoner exchange, that also greatly enhances Hamas's position. I mean, if we try to name one prisoner that that what's his name Abbas, you know the PA so called PA, they've never gotten a single prisoner out of an Israeli dungeon. The Lebanese government as well, in terms of the Lebanese, the never with the, for, the Lebanese prisoners for, for all for all of these societies for Palestinian society in general, like Lebanese society, but in this case for Palestinian society. To have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people held in Israel's prisons, which are appalling places, like something out of the you know out of the darkness of the of the Middle Ages, these prisons that the Israelis keep keeping people in solitary confinement, abusing people, sexual abuse, and what are the all rates? kinds of abuse. The, the, the rates are 99 percent conviction rates. No, I mean, no, no, no. In many cases, they don't even convict people because the Israelis in, in the West Bank can arrest people on what they call administrative detention. Which they can keep renewing indefinitely without there ever being a trial. So, and like these children that they hold, a lot of these kids that they, that are now being released, and the young women that are, that they're now releasing, even the older men that they're now releasing the Israelis, they're you know they, a lot of them were held on administrative detention. So we have, and then this like w w by the way, when this comes up, it's not only enhancing Hamas's reputation among Palestinians and Arabs, it's also sort of you know like I've seen discussions of this on CNN, for example where an anchor is interviewing somebody who knows about how the Israeli military legal system works, and the anchor is sort of shocked, shocked, because there it is on CNN. Oh, yeah, they can arrest people, and they can hold them indefinitely without trial, in perpetuity, basically, without trial. It's shocking to hear it. it, it all of this adds to increasing Western perceptions of Israel as the apartheid state that it is, you know, because, again, this thing of being able to arbitrarily arrest, including children, I mean, the idea of a state holding hundreds of children prisoner. I mean, it's it's like what other state on the planet, as far as I know of, certainly no other state with the blessing of the West or that has Western blessing, holds children in, in dungeons. I mean, like it's, this is unheard of across the Western world. No other state does this. And it's because these children are under Israeli military rule and hence subject to military forms of detention, which means this thing of administrative detention where you can be held indefinitely with, in perpetuity, basically without trial. So all of this, again, enhances Hamas's position politically. And and yeah, as Osama was saying, or Karim or one of you was saying, you know, at the end of the day, the Israelis were going to destroy, remember at the very beginning also, we're not going to stop shooting until all the prisoners have been released. Yeah, well, yeah. guess what? Now the prisoners are coming out 10 here and five there and three there on Hamas's terms also. And secondly, we will not negotiate with Hamas. Well, yeah, as you said, Karim, you know, yeah, you are negotiating with Hamas. Again, all these kinds of things, first of all, show Israel's, at the end of the day, its weakness in these terms for all of its capacity to inflict harm. It's weak in, these other, in, in, this, in this other kind of domain. And again, enhances Hamas's position. So to go back to the spectacle, when you see these Palestinian, especially this first wave, who are all children for the most part, 
or young people being restored to their family. When you see a 10 year or 12 year old boy running to see his mother, whom he hasn't seen however many, however long he's been in one of these horrible dungeons that these Rathis maintain, you know, it's like this, it's joy. And this brings joy to people. People in the West, they want to talk about Hamas in all kinds of terms that again, buy into a, an older discourse of Orientalism and, you know, Islamic tyranny and all this kind of stuff which the West, Western audiences are primed, they have long been primed to receive this sense of Western, sorry, of Eastern Oriental despotism and violence and Islamic fundamental, all, the, all these narratives, the discourse of terrorism and all the rest of it, all that feeds it. But in terms of people on the ground, they want their family members back. They want these people who've been arbitrarily arrested by the Israeli army to be released. And it brings joy to people. No matter what you say, it brings joy to people. The flip side is very, very interesting when you see the condition under which the Israeli prisoners are being released is, as Karim said, <laughs> media blackout, especially for that one, the one woman who was released quite early on. Yeah, yeah. You know, who said, well, yeah, they actually, they treated us very well. And she said shalom at the end to, her, to, the, to the Hamas guy taking her to the bus and so on. It's like, yeah, they treated us pretty well. It was fine. We, we were, you know, well, yeah, they brought a doctor in. We, we ate like them. We, they had a toilet that they cleaned every day, like all this kind of stuff. This time, they don't want any of those details getting out because it's it will reveal that who knows Janine, or wherever these people, or Bethlehem, or wherever. Didn't they pass a law? Isn't there some law where they declare everybody a terrorist if you celebrate your, it's your one terrorist? Of these, it's basically, it's not a law, it's a, it's a threat. If you celebrate, we're going to put you back in jail. So, yeah, this, again, this goes, just going back to the political position of Hamas, this vastly enhances Hamas's political position uh, in Palestinian society, Palestinian political movement, so forth. It reveals all the more, by contrast, the you know the duplicity the the coward the coward the, the 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 kleptocracy that is the Palestinian Authority the inept the bumbling at best this is to be generous the bumbling ineptitude of Mahmoud Abbas uh, and and so on and so there's like the the contrast is palpable so again if this is what the Israelis wanted to do was to enhance Hamas's prestige both militarily and politically well they've bravo they've done that at this at this you know in, insufferable you know unspeakable human toll. I don't think that's what they wanted. This, again, speaks to where we are, politically speaking. They're not getting what they wanted, the Israelis. They're, they're, on the contrary, they're being forced to concede in all kinds of ways. They are negotiating. This whole thing could have ended on October 8th with negotiation, right? but they refuse to negotiate, right? This whole thing could be resolved through negotiation, and, and that's, kind of, that's kind of where we're heading. So, again, all these as sort of, in terms of auguries of where we're going to go in the next phase, I think they speak to Israeli weakness, not to Israeli strengths. For, again, with the caveat that they can, they have, and they will continue to inflict unspeakable suffering in human terms on Palestinian civilians in Gaza. And obviously in the West Bank. In the West Bank and East Jerusalem yeah. and everywhere yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. So just maybe to wrap up here, I think, uh, I think so, what you're saying, and, and it's interesting, we, it's interesting that even you know, 45, 50 minutes into this podcast, we, we're not, we haven't even had time to, and maybe for a different episode, we haven't even had time to go back and say, yeah, I mean, we need to contextualize all of this in this long history, basically, of uh, not so there's the Nakba and all of this, but there's also just incredible political failure, political opportunities, political failure from Oslo onwards, at least if you want to start there, you know, Oslo onwards, and this question of uh, of of uh, you know trying to create some alleged Palestinian state, but instead creating some kind of crony Palestinian authority, which is not only corrupt but actually serves the interests of the Israeli occupier. I think that's fairly clear at this point. And on the other hand, the Europeans and the others working within that framework, funding and making sure that 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 you know sort of ordinary Palestinians. Uh, had to get jobs uh, through either you know, funded civil society type projects or through the Palestinian Authority, which is a single, as I understand it, the single biggest uh, employer in the, in the West Bank, for example. So there's this kind of dependency that was created 
Uh, the Europeans kind of pay for that. They fund that kind of infrastructure, kind of humanitarian on uh, civil society, all this kind of stuff to keep people sedate, more or less politically sedate, let's say. And on the other hand, Gaza, which was being besieged, totally being besieged, uh, and, and you know, it's like, okay, let's just forget about it. You know, we, we left, and so let's just forget about it. And now that they've dared to say something, now there's this incredible reaction taking place. And of course, in Jerusalem itself, in which the the, the, the kind of cleansing of Christians as well as Muslims there has been ongoing and, and in places like Sheikh Jarrah and other places where, uh, you know, last year and a couple of years ago, there was a, a very big, uh, you know, was in the news, let's say globally for, for a while anyway. And so it's interesting to see all of these threads coming together and, and always, you know, keeping this in mind. We, sometimes we get so into the details, we forget about this, this broader picture of political failure and opportunities that could have resolved all of this in a way that was fair for, or, or, you know, as, as just as could be to, to all the parties, the Israelis, the, 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 the Palestinians, and everybody else. And that failure, in a sense, is on this long history of, of I, I would say, American uh, failure and, and, uh, and complicity in, in the failure of, this, of these kinds of so-called peace processes. And I think it's important to do that. And, and I, I personally would like to end by saying, just to go back to the beginning and talking about the UN and the UN resolutions, my, my point was that the kind of public pressure that was being built on this, that trend has become very clear, even in the utterances of some of these European leaders. So the Spanish and the Belgians, who were, who were relatively much more progressive, even in the first days, and who voted, for example, for the UN General Assembly resolution, uh, calling for some kind of you know, humanitarian pause early on, the first few days, uh, they've now come out and said, you know, Spain has now recalled its ambassador. They came out a couple of days ago, they were at the, at the border of Rafah, and, and they were talking about how uh, there needs to be an immediate ceasefire and, and the, 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 the attacks on civilians has to end and the very strong language. And the Spanish uh, prime minister kind of gave a lecture to Netanyahu, which was really quite interesting, and the, and the Belgian as well. So these guys were ahead. The, the British, who were extremely uh, pro-Israeli and, and allowing the Israelis to do whatever they want, to kind of, you know, allowing, following the American thing, you know, as they do. For, but now they're shifting back to this middle position where, okay, yes, self-defense, but, you know, they have to be aware and civilians and, you know, damage, and we have to be careful and we have to sort of, you know, wrap this up, basically. So everybody is shifting, except for, and even the American State Department, others are all shifting. Congress, as I understand it, maybe you guys can, can just say a word about that. Even there, there's more and more uh, congressmen calling for, congresspeople calling for a ceasefire. And, you know, this, this kind of thing is growing. And it seems to be uh, Biden himself personally, with maybe his inner circle, that are kind of resisting this kind of diplomatic move. But I don't think that pressure can go on for, for very, very long. So I just wanted to say that as a final kind of thought. They can't withstand the pressure for very long. I don't think so, personally. Remember, Condoleezza Rice and George W. Bush in 2006, I mean, leave George W. Bush. I'm not sure how much he knew, but- uh, Well, same with Biden. Well, Condoleezza Rice and Cheney and these people in 2006 were, were, were absolutely adamantly opposed as well, just as invested and just as opposed. I think as Biden is today, so uh, quite clear. But um, I have no interest in um, diplomacy for the sake of returning Lebanon and Israel to the status quo ante. I think it would be a mistake. Um, what we're seeing here, in a sense, is the the growing the birth pangs of a new Middle East. And uh, whatever we do, we have to be certain that we're pushing forward to the new Middle East, not going back to the, the old one. James? The cabinet um, members. You're right. Facts in the, in the end, it's, it, it, everything depends on what happens on the ground. The, there's a slight difference that's important to point out, which is that Hamas, unlike Hezbollah, the attack on October 7th did kill many Jewish Israelis. And they did abduct many Jewish Israeli you know, civilians. Whereas Hezbollah in 2006 never did that. So the, the attack was, was very specifically to, to soldiers, etc. That's why, in a sense, the European, especially the European reaction was, you know, yes, we're with Israelis, but, you know, careful. And, you know, they, they were sort of nowhere near what they were here because of the, the actual attacks on actual Jewish Israelis, which is unprecedented in, in the scope. That's, that is, that was, and we, we shouldn't forget how traumatic that is for Jewish Israeli society and for the, the European countries that have been backing them for historical or political or whatever reasons, this, this was so that this first week or two, there was a lot of trauma for them.
politically and socially and on a human level. I, I don't think there's any doubt. I think that's sincere. You're talking about the Israelis or the Euro Europeans? Oh, both, both. I mean, when you look at the German reaction, for example, but on the Israeli side, the Jewish Israeli side. I think the German sure. reaction. We need a but whole. Think, we need a whole separate podcast on the. Yeah, a whole session for the Germans. Honestly, there. We need a whole separate Beyond, reaction, yeah. a podcast on all the European and, and the U.S. reactions to this. Um, but um, so, where where do we leave it then? I mean, look, what happened? I mean, just to, on this point of October seventh, it's clear that what happened October seventh, because it involved the killing of Israeli civilians. Um, obviously, you know, which, which shouldn't have happened, but, and obviously the Israeli state has done everything it can to, to capitalize on this, to mine it to the last, you know, to get everything in terms of political capital than it can out of the, out of the events of October. But even, even that, like, there's only so much you can squeeze a lemon and basically no matter how much the Israeli state is trying to get out of, to capitalize on the violence, you know, the, the killing of Israeli civilians on October 7th, there's only so much they can do at some point. You know, there's like some sense of proportionality is going to come into play here, and people are going to, as you're, which is what's happening now with Europeans, and it's happening even in the U.S. So I think at this point, Biden. I mean, it's hard to know what's going on in Biden's mind. I don't, I don't honestly, don't, I don't think anybody really knows. I mean, maybe he knows, but you know, it's not clear. Is is he, is he just this? You know, is he as 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 is he as out of it as he often seems to be? Not just on this, but on all kinds of other questions too. And then every now, I think one, that's one possibility. When he when he has a sense of lucidity, he thinks he's back in the 1980s because he talks like this is back in the 1980s. We're not in the 1980s. I think Biden and his whole entourage are completely disconnected from where the American where the American people are, and people are saying this open more and more openly. Basically, this is going to cost Biden. He's losing a lot of support. He's, he's going to lose, it's going to cost him the election next year in all likelihood. I mean, this this is he's doing damage to himself at this point too. Because of because of because of the stance he's taking, which is which is increasingly unpopular in the U.S. and the rising levels of skepticism about this in, in, in Congress are are also coming home to roost. The, the media coverage, I mean, even places like the New York Times, which is the last place you would expect to see, you know, sort of headlines and, and front page cover stories about what's happening in Gaza. Some of the stories that they have on the front page of the New York Times, which is which remains the liberal paper, you know, of record, you know, like. The one, I don't know, 10 days ago. Unprecedented. Ago. It's un the unprecedented damage, no, but the one 10 days ago where they said Gaza had become a, a graveyard for children. I mean, like, this kind of thing sears into American liberal consciousness in a way. And it's all of this. And the UN statements as well. Yeah. Yeah. All of this is going to do more and more and more damage to Israel standing in the US, at least on the liberal side of things, even to some extent on the conservative side of things. It's, and this goes back to what I said in my book too, on, uh, alas, which is that. Israel is henceforth no longer going to be the darling of the liberal progressive West as it had been for decades from the 1950s and 60s on. It's now going to become the murderous darling of the hard right, of the anti-immigrant, anti-minority, you know, anti, anti, -minority, uh, anti, anti civil rights kind of factions, not just in the US, but in Europe too. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to see that. Now, the question is, you know, which, which of these political forces has has more clout, politically speaking, you know, I guess we'll find out in the future. That's, that's, that, that remains to be seen. Yeah. Well, I think we can wrap this up now. And, uh, and I mean, this, there's, there's a lot, and I'd love to hear from Osama. Maybe next we need a whole show on, I, I think Biden has gone on to this evangelical tone. I think he's just, he, he's he, like George Bush did. I mean, he's sort of, he's, he's has this bone in his mouth. And I think he's just, that's it. He's just, the more people are going after him, the more he's just, uh, he's got this evangelical thing. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's evangelical. I think he's said, Catholic. Said, 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 he, said he has gone back. No, I know, but I mean, in tone, in tone. Dina, stop the recording here, Habibi. Said, 